All right, so it is my pleasure to introduce our moderator, Dr. Thomas Loyal. Lloyd, I'm sorry, an Associate Professor of Neurology at John Hopkins School of Medicine. He's the co-director of the John Hopkins Myositis Center and a member of TMA's Medical Advisory Board. And joining him, we have four panelists. We have Dr. Goyle, who's an Associate Professor of Neurology at University of California, Irvine, and specializes in neuromuscular medicine. Um, we have Dr. Weil, an Associate Professor of Neurology at Washington University School of Medicine in St. Louis. And we have Dr. Mozafar, who is a professor and chair of neurology, professor of orthopedic surgery and pathology and laboratory medicine, and director of the neuromuscular program um, at the University of California at Irvine. We also have joining us from Germany, uh, we have Dr. Schmidt, who is a neurologist and head of the neuromuscular center at the University Medical Center Gottingen in Germany. Um, where his lab specializes in research into disease mechanisms of myositis. We're, it's truly our pleasure to have these members of the Myositis uh, Medical Advisory Board with us, and so we look forward to hearing on inclusion body myositis. Thank you all. All right, uh, let me see if I can, if I can share my screen. Is uh, everyone able to see my uh, screen and hear me okay? I could just get a thumbs up. Okay, perfect. Um, all right. Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, so, in the interest of time, I, I will skip over the uh, introduction, which uh, actually Laura, uh, Laurie has uh, already given us, and uh, dive right in. So, uh, what I would like to uh, actually talk a little bit about are 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 some of our uh, our clinical research uh, and trials that are um, underway at Johns Hopkins, uh, as as well as a new mouse model of uh, IBM. So you'll hear you'll hear from uh, actually Dr. Goyle about uh, the Aramakamol and and Seralimus trials, and uh, what I would like to uh, actually actually briefly mention uh, here is that uh, we have a small trial at, uh, at Johns Hopkins of a drug known as actually pioglitazone, uh, which is currently approved for the uh, treatment of diabetes. And, and uh, the way that it works is that it uh, is actually thought to uh, increase mito uh, mitochondrial biogenesis and function. And we've actually just finished the uh, uh, last visit of our, our, our 16th patient, and the uh, uh, analysis is ongoing, and we hope uh, we'll have results to share uh, at the end of the uh, year. Uh, we have a number of, uh, of clinical research projects. Um, one is we are uh, analyzing all of our clinical data uh, uh, from the IBM patients in our, our myositis registry. And uh, uh, from about, uh, about 400 IBM patients, uh, what we found, so uh, uh, everyone knows that uh, IBM is, is, is most common in, uh, in, in white uh, men. And uh, what we're seeing is that in, uh, other demographics, it uh, often presents differently. And um, in, in women in particular, uh, they are, uh, are frequently misdiagnosed and, uh, and treated uh, often long-term with uh, immunosuppressant medications. Uh, interestingly, African-Americans uh, uh, actually present at an earlier age and, and seem to have a more rapid progression. Um, and uh, almost a third of our uh, IBM patients uh, actually have signs and symptoms of uh, neuropathy, including uh, uh, loss of sensation in their feet. And uh, we think at least in some patients, this is, uh, is likely contributing to some of the uh, imbalance and, uh, and falls. Um, we are uh, actually just starting to embark in a uh, large uh, uh, survey of, 
IBM patients in which we're hoping to um, actually learn better the uh, actual clinical features at uh, initial diagnosis, uh, how, how those will actually predict the uh, long-term prognosis. We also have um, a number of, of genetic studies underway uh, in which we are uh, really trying to understand uh, how the, uh, our, our genes can uh, uh, actually uh, increase the risk of developing IBM in hopes that uh, it will shed uh, insight into uh, what causes IBM and, uh, and hopefully new treatment targets. Um, many of you are uh, aware of the uh, actually TMA's initiative of, of uh, this new myositis tracker. And, and it's a, uh, a tool for uh, improving communication uh, in between patients and their, uh, uh, their actual, actual providers. And our um, uh, hope is that uh, we can use something like this uh, in the form of an app, uh, which everyone, uh, everyone can download um, on their smartphone phone and can be used in, uh, in, in further research projects. In, uh, in March of this year, we had a uh, uh, FDA listening session uh, in which the uh, FDA gave uh, us advice in terms of uh, how to accelerate the uh, approval of drugs for uh, IBM patients. Um, one of their uh, recommendations is uh, actually a, uh, a natural history study, uh, which will, uh, which uh, you'll hear a lot more about in the next talk. Um, another is uh, actually trying to uh, improve uh, outcome measures that can be uh, used in clinical trials. And so uh, myself and Bhaskar Roy at Yale have uh, actually started a new uh, IBM scientific interest group um, under uh, what's known as IMAX, uh, led by Lisa Ryder at the uh, NIH. And, and the goal of, uh, of, of uh, this initiative is to uh, really, uh, uh, really develop better, uh, more reliable measurements that are sensitive to change that can be used uh, in clinical trials. And um, all of our, uh, our subgroups listed here uh, will uh, actually require input from uh, IBM patients. And so um, uh, many of you uh, will be asked for uh, actual feedback on some of these outcome measures. Um, and, th and, and uh, then finally, what I'd like to uh, uh, actually talk to you guys a little bit about is uh, what my lab has been focusing on is, uh, is developing an, an animal model of uh, inclusion body myositis. And, uh, and this is, is really spearheaded by a uh, really talented uh, graduate student in the lab, Kyla Britson, who is uh, actually defending her, her, uh, her uh, thesis for her, her PhD next week via Zoom. Uh, anyone who's interested is, is welcome to join, just let me know. And, and uh, the way that it, uh, works is that uh, IBM patient muscle is uh, actually collected during a, uh, a diagnostic muscle biopsy, uh, dissected into small pieces, and then uh, implanted into the leg of immunodeficient mice. The uh, muscle uh, actually breaks down, but the uh, muscle stem cells are uh, able to regenerate new muscle, which is then uh, uh, revascularized and innervated by the mouse host. So that uh, after about four months, uh, what you end up with 
is uh, a, uh, a fully humanized muscle uh, within a, uh, a mouse host. And so in addition to using this model for um, uh, really trying to better uh, understand what causes IBM, uh, we can also use it to uh, actually test new drugs. Uh, remarkably, this model uh, really seems to, uh, to work uh, uh, incredibly well. The uh, muscle regenerates uh, as well as uh, actually healthy controls. Uh, and um, we're able to see all the pathological uh, hallmarks of, uh, of uh, inclusion body myositis, um, including inflammation, uh, uh, rim vacuoles, and protein inclusions. And so uh, actually, actually some of the uh, initial drugs that were uh, interested in, uh, in testing in, the, in this new model, um, one is a, uh, a monoclonal uh, antibody developed by uh, at Puro, uh, a, uh, a company, uh, a company uh, actually founded, founded by Steve Greenberg, um, in which he has, uh, has generated uh, antibodies which can uh, actually target the uh, aggressive T cells that uh, invade muscle. Uh, another drug that we um, are, are, planning, are planning to test is a, uh, a gene therapy myostatin uh, inhibitor that acts uh, uh, actually very similar to the uh, AAV folostatin, uh, which has been in trials in IBM. Uh, however, it uh, acts inside the muscle cell uh, rather, rather than being secreted. And so uh, in theory should have uh, actually fewer side effects and, uh, 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 and be more potent. Um, now it's uh, uh, one, one real advantage of, uh, of having a mouse model is that um, we can actually, actually rapidly test uh, a number of combinations of therapy. And it uh, uh, may actually be that uh, ultimately to uh, actually cure IBM, we'll want to uh, actually target uh, all three pathways. So, so uh, slowing uh, uh, inflammation, uh, uh, slowing degeneration, and also um, accelerating regeneration. And, and so with that, I will, uh, I will thank uh, all the members of my lab and collaborators and, uh, and funding sources. And so now I think I have to stop my screen share and then I will make, uh, Dr. Mozafar, the host. Thanks, Tom. Um, that was a really good uh, overview. So I think Thomas made my life a little bit easier. And what I really like to talk to you about is the study that we have proposed, um, and it. Uh, it looks promising um, that it may actually happen and start, um, but I wanted to take you through the rationale for why we would be doing this study. This study is designed to look at the uh, influence of the serum antibodies to NT5C1A on disease progression, um, on the uh, disease behavior, as well as looking at other biomarkers, uh, muscle biomarkers in, uh, in IBM, um, and it's a, it's a natural history study, um, um, per se. And this was all based on um, this work that we had done about five years ago. Dr. Goyal was the lead author on that paper, where we showed that patients who are uh, positive for the NT5C1 antibodies behave differently than patients who were negative. Um, both in terms of proximal muscle strength, so they, they had difficulty with this uh, outcome measure called time get up, which is a measure of how fast they can get up from a standard chair. Um, and patients with uh, antibody positive took longer time, which was statistically significant. They also had lower um, lung capacities, um, even though they were not symptomatic, 
but when you measured their lung capacity, they were uh, lower. They also required um, uh, more assistive devices. So the, the percentage of patients who required a walker or a wheelchair was much higher and statistically uh, different. Um, and uh, the patients who were antibody positive also uh, had a lot more uh, swallowing difficulty than patients who were not uh, antibody positive. This um, work was replicated um, at other sites, um, not all, all aspects of it, uh, but one of the studies that came out of the uh, if a large consortium of European centers with about 300 patients um, also showed an interesting finding that patients who were antibody positive on an average lived about eight years less than patients who were antibody negative. This is work by James Lilliker, um, and that was published uh, about uh, three or four years ago. Now, more recently, Dr. Chris Wiles, um, very talented postdoc, um, Dr. Ikenaga, has been looking at some of our combined data. And at least for our cohort of patients at UC Irvine, uh, it looks like that the same is true, um, um, but we're still analyzing some of this data. So I think there may be a signal and there uh, in terms of mortality. And I think all of these um, studies, these were all relatively small studies. They were done either as a single time point or as a retrospective, which means we went back and looked at the data that was already collected. And there is a need to confirm some of these findings uh, in a more um, prospective, um, carefully designed fashion. So um, to add to that, there is some hint uh, at least looking at animal models and cell culture models, that there is a difference between patients, um, a, a serum that is antibody positive versus serum uh, from patients who are antibody negative. And this was a very creative study from the Japanese group where they took blood from patient, IBM patients who were either antibody positive or antibody negative and then move uh, and pass them into a mouse uh, um, uh, or they put it on a uh, mouse um, uh, muscle culture, um, uh, a myoblast culture. And they showed that only um, serum uh, from uh, antibody positive patients made a pathological difference where these uh, muscles um, both in mice as well as in the myoblast cultures developed these specific inclusions um, that were um, seen, and then this was not seen in seronegative um, blood, and it was not seen when you did uh, a controlled um, sample. So there again, a suggestion that the inflammation or the antibodies may be responsible for some of the degenerative changes that we see. Um, but as I said, some of the uh, a lot of these um, findings need to be replicated and and shown in a scientifically designed uh, prospective study. So what um, the reason I got interested in it, and I think that the reason all of us are interested in it, that this is a major barrier to clinical trials. We, we, we are uh, getting into a phase where we will see more clinical trials in IBM, but I have to confess that I'm not sure that we really understand the disease very well. We don't understand the rates of the disease progression. Um, and I, I, I would draw parallels to ALS, where uh, in ALS we know that they are, every patient behaves differently. There are different rates of progression, whether they are fast progressors, slow progressors, whether the same happens in IBM or not, we don't know. Uh, we don't know what um, disease factors influence disease progression, um, whether the antibodies, whether the abnormal lymphocytes they have, um, whether any of these um, influence disease progression or behavior. Um, and we know that uh, IBM is um, a very slow progressive disease. And any such observation that we want to make uh, will take two to three years. And, and unfortunately, these observations cannot be made uh, in the context of a clinical trial. It has to be done as a standalone observational study. So we uh, about three years ago, we um, put together um, a um, large study of about 150 patients um, it has evolved over the years, so it now has 13 centers involved in it. It's a prospective um, study, so that means that we'll be collecting data as we go along. 
um, and we already have decided what data we want to collect. It's a non-interventional study, so there will not be any medication and medications or interventions there. Um, and there are four arms that we uh, proposed. One was looking at whether the presence of antibodies really influences disease progression over a two-year period. Um, and we will be doing um, uh, measurements every six months. Uh, we also wanted to look at muscle biopsy specimens, fresh muscle biopsy specimens. So see if uh, there are differences in muscle pathology based on whether you're antibody positive or negative. We wanted to take a deeper dive into these um, abnormal lymphocytes, especially these, this concept of immunosenescent lymphocytes. Um, and then finally, we wanted to look at respiratory functions in more detail. Um, and and there they are rationales for each of these, and I don't, I don't want to bore you, and I don't think we have the time um, to bore you with this, but there, um, there's in, there are enough questions out there that, that justify um, why we need to do this study and, um, and do it in this fashion. Um, it's also very important that when we do clinical trials, that we stratify our treatment groups based on whether they have these biomarkers or not. It's possible that patient who are antibody positive may behave differently in terms of disease response compared to patients who are antibody negative. Um, so this is the schedule of visits. It's not um, a terrible burden. We, we do, we're doing five visits per patient. So they are six months apart uh, and we will collect a whole bunch of assessments as part of this, including uh, physical assessments, um, blood testing um, and, and some uh, patient reported outcome measures. Um, the second uh, outcome um, is muscle biopsies. Um, and for, for about 50 out of those 150 patients, we will collect, we will ask them to, um, uh, to give us a fresh muscle biopsy specimen. These will be open biopsies. Um, and then they will be processed um, for different uh, markers, including lymphocytes. Um, and what we really wanna see if there is a pathology difference between the positive patients and negative patients. There are some suggestions that, that there may be differences in number of rimmed vacuoles, number of mitochondrial depletion um, changes. But then we also want to look at some additional cells, including this um, cell called KV1.3, which is of special interest to us because it may be amenable to a treatment. Um, one of the theories is that um, patients' uh, inflammatory cells stop responding to to chemotherapy or conventional chemotherapy because they acquire certain changes in their uh, morphology. Um, so again, these are routine. Um, the hypothesis three was to look at the lymphocytes in a bigger, de uh, in more de uh, detail, take a deeper dive, but in addition, also look at these affected uh, memory T cells as well as these KV1.3 channels uh, in the muscle. Um, and there's some preliminary data that suggests that there is a, a abundance of these CD57 as well as KLRG1 um, positive cells. And we also found a reasonably high percentage of KV1.3 positive cells as well. So we want to uh, define the incidence of these cells better so we can um, then um, uh, plan interventional therapy based on these lymphocyte markers and that. Um, so there, there are a whole bunch of outcome assessments which are blood-based, um, but we also will look at the muscle um, because the muscle biopsy will be collected at the same time as the blood samples. So we can actually directly correlate the muscle changes from the blood changes and such. And then the final hypothesis was to look at respiratory failure, which is we've, we are finding it an important contributor of disease morbidity and mortality uh, we recent, recently lost two IBM patients because of severe uh, respiratory in, uh, uh, insufficiency. And this is something that's not been very well characterized um, in IBM. So I think there's a desperate need to, to define it better. Um, we, the power calculations that we did, we think we um, can, ease, okay, we can uh, get these data uh, or at least conclusions at 150 patients, which is a large number. We've picked a, a consortium of 13 myositis centers all in the US um, because this is going to be an NIH funded study. So going outside the US sometimes creates complications. Each site has a lot of patients and we only uh, asking for 12 patients per site, so it's, it's a very doable strategy. 
Um, pr but prior to doing that, we actually did a survey and some of you may have participated in the survey um, where we polled patients in the US as well as in Australia on their willingness to undergo a two-year non-interventional study. And um, we, um, not surprisingly, a overwhelming majority of patients were willing to undergo not only testing, but even muscle biopsies as part of a non-interventional study. We also held a community engagement studio back in March of 2019. There was a, it was a very helpful input from the key stakeholders, the patients, the caregivers, um, and it really informed some of our study designs um, based on that. So where we stand right now um, is that the grant got a good score. It's a fundable score. Uh, unfortunately, um, one, we are dependent on the new fiscal year budget for the NIH. Number two, the whole COVID situation has put um, a, a lot of uncertainty on whether they're gonna be saving money to fund COVID studies rather than IBM studies. So we don't have a funding decision yet. The council meeting is at end, end of October. I'm, I'm thinking positive that it will get funded. And if it gets funded, um, we hope to start in the new year and, and we're hoping to have a first patient enrolled in 2021. Um, it'll take about a year to recruit all the patients and then 24 months from that to complete the study. So I'm hoping that this will get done. We will have good data. Um, there'll be a lot of data that we can analyze for years to come. Um, so um, I, I, I might need your help in, in pressing on to your uh, local um, um, politicians that this kind of studies. And as, as Tom, uh, Tom said, even the FDA agrees that a natural history like this is very important for better clinical trials and treatment trials. So I'm gonna head, end here with a picture um, of the sunset at Laguna Beach a couple of days ago. Oh, I'm sorry, a, couple, a month ago. Am I, um, who's next, Tom? I am, Tatra okay. Mozar. Okay, make host. Okay, I'll share my screen. Can everyone see my screen? Great. Yes. Um, I want to thank Dr. Lloyd and the Myositis Association for bringing us all together today. Um, I'm really glad to be here. I hope everyone's well and doing okay despite the pandemic. I think it's been interesting times and I'm glad to see the number of pa uh, patients that are participating today. Um, I'd like to give you an update on what's going on with clinical trials in IBM. There's a number of trials that are ongoing and we hope that are upcoming. Um, Dr. Mosifier and I are certainly planning a few trials in the upcoming future. And so I thought I would share some of this with you guys. Um, as many of you guys know, the reason that it's been so challenging to find a treatment in inclusion body myositis is that the cause is still largely unknown. Um, we think that the cause is a potentially complex interplay between cellular stressors, inflammation, and even protein accumulation. And so the main question that still has remained unclear is, is the inflammation that we see in muscle biopsies of IBM patients, is that the primary process? Or is it actually a secondary response to the degenerative pathway? that we see in IBM. Since the 1990s, several uh, therapeutic invest, um, agents have been investigated. So back in the 1990s, several immunosuppressive um, medications have been tried, corticosteroids, methotrexate, azathioprine, these are all either small or um, clinical trials that have been done or randomized studies. IVIG, some with some transient benefit, but essentially all of these agents have failed to show a sustained improvement in IBM, including as many of you guys know, the latest clinical trial, Bimagrumab, that was published in Lancet Neurology in 2019, where 251 patients were enrolled worldwide 
And um, despite all the efforts and excitement with bemagrumab, and despite showing that it was able to increase muscle mass, all the measures of functional assessment failed in the study. And so Novartis at that time decided to stop drug development in IBM. And so really efforts have been focused on other agents that we can try in IBM. Um, we all understand the urgency. We understand the unmet need for developing drugs in IBM. And um, one of these agents, as many of you guys know, is aramaclamol. Aramaclamol is a drug that augments heat shock protein expression and is postulated to have several neuroprotective effects. So there was a small phase 2A study done that was published in 2013. Um, there were two sites involved. It was a double-blind placebo-controlled study, uh, one site at Kansas and one site in London. And 16 patients were randomized to receive aramoclamol. Eight patients were on placebo. They were treated for four months duration, and the study concluded that it was a safe and well-tolerated drug. When they looked at secondary outcome measures, there were actually no statistically significant differences. However, there were several uh, measures that showed trends in favor of aramoclamol. So if you look at the graph, on the left side, it's looking at the IBM functional rating scale. And you can see at eight months, um, there is a trend in favor of uh, aramoclamol both at eight months and at 12 months. And then on the right side, when you look at grip strength at eight months and 12 months, you also see this uh, trend in favor of aramoclamol. So um, since the study showed that after four months of treatment, it was safe and well tolerated, um, they decided to do a larger study to explore some of these trends and to prove efficacy. So as many of you guys know and are probably participating, uh, there is a phase two, three study that is ongoing. It's a double blind placebo controlled study. There are 11 sites in the US and one in London. This is led by KU Dr. Demachki. And um, patients are randomized to receive aramoclamol 400 milligrams three times a day or placebo and are being treated for 20 months. The primary outcome uh, measure in this study is measuring the rate of decline based on the IBM functional rating scale. And then there are several secondary outcome measures that we're going to learn about from this study. So uh, just a study update is it has been completely enrolled. I touched base with Dr. Demachki earlier this week, and he wanted everyone to know that the study is ongoing and it's going well despite COVID-19's challenges, thanks to a great team. And so the results are anticipated by at least mid next year. So to be continued and we're hoping um, to hear about this study very soon. By next year, this time, we'll have the results for sure. The other drug that is, um, has generated a lot of enthusiasm is rapamycin or serolimus. Rapamycin is an mTOR inhibitor that is thought to regulate autophagy. Autophagy, um, basically trying to restore abnormal protein degradation. And so this drug also was studied in a phase 2b study led by Dr. Benveniste from France. This was a double-blind placebo-controlled study done from 2015 to 2017. 44 patients were enrolled in the study. 22 patients received drug and 22 were on placebo and they were treated for a 12-month period. Um, the primary outcome measure in the study was measuring the quadricep strength. As many of you know, the quadriceps is affected in IBM. And it did not show that there was an, an improvement in the quadriceps strength. However, there were some very interesting secondary outcome measures 
that did reach statistical significance. And Dr. Benveniste shared this data with me. Um, you can see on the graph on the left that patients that received rapamycin, rapamycin did show an improvement in the six minute walk test in comparison to patients that were on placebo. And what's really interesting um, is the graph on the right, you see a quantitative muscle MRI. Um, MRI helps us evaluate the muscle and we look at it for edema, we look at it for fatty replacement and atrophy. And a lot of IBM patients, what we tend to see is fatty replacement, that the muscle is damaged and it's replaced by fat. Well, interestingly, the patients that received rapamycin had less fatty replacement when they looked at the MRI in comparison to placebo. So these results have really generated a lot of enthusiasm for ex further exploring rapamycin and serolimus. And as many of you have heard, and Dr. Lloyd mentioned, is that in June of this year, Professor Needham from Australia received a very large grant to further explore these findings and start a study, a phase three study to confirm the findings that Dr. Benveniste has initially found in the phase 2b study. There are seven sites that are, will be funded in Australia and planned, um, and there are two sites that are identified in the U.S., Kansas University and Johns Hopkins, and there's five sites that are planned in Europe. So uh, I'm told that this study should be starting hopefully sometime mid to late next year. And um, I think this is a very interesting drug, so we should be hearing um, and hopefully getting interesting results from this study soon. Um, and then these are more preliminary thoughts, work from both Dr. Mozafar, myself, our immunologist at Irvine, and um, with collaboration with Dr. Greenberg. But as Dr. Mozafar mentioned, KV1.3 uh, is expressed on T effector memory cells and, in, and is found in IBM muscle. And so there is a drug called dilazotide uh, that can block these cells and it's under development for psoriatic arthritis. And so we've been thinking about can this drug or another drug that can uh, block KV1.3 be helpful in IBM. Um, and then there's some very preliminary observations from an analysis of a study we've done look, look, finding that a majority of CDA-positive T cells in IBM patients express KLRG1, a marker that, of highly differentiated cytotoxic T cells that is found in both IBM muscle and in blood. And you can see here on the graphs um, a much higher expression of these cells in IBM patients in comparison to other T cells. So can we uh, block these cells and potentially help um, regulate the IBM pathway? We've also looked at these cells and on the left you can see that these cells are present throughout disease duration despite how many years um, patients have IBM, um, as well as despite disease severity based on the graph on the right with the IBM functional rating scale. So um, we do have further work and analysis to be done. We'd like to compare it to age matched, uh, normal healthy controls, and we're still evaluating these cells, but we're working with both Dr. Greenberg and our immunologist, Dr. Villalta, uh, here at Irvine to further explore these findings. Um, and then lastly, I just want to say that um, as you guys have been hearing, there's still a number of unanswered questions that can help design the study of uh, the design of clinical trials. So as Dr. Mozafar mentioned, we still really need to understand the natural history better. Um, in order to design a clinical trial proper, properly, we need to be able to know the exact rate of progression of IBM patients so that 
the duration of a drug is tested appropriately. How do you test a drug um, in a short time period in a slow progressive disease? Um, and as Dr. Uh, Lloyd mentioned, um, are we actually using the correct agent? Should we start thinking like our oncology colleagues that use chemotherapy, where we should be looking at chemotherapy uh, combination therapies? Not only bimagrumab that can help make the muscle larger, but aramoclamol that can help the degenerative pathway. Um, and I, a lot of us have been thinking more about combination therapies. And we still have to understand which outcome measures are most important and helpful in um, figuring out, does a drug work? So can we figure out, um, are these out outcome measures sensitive, sensitive enough to detect change? The Novartis study used the six minute walk test. Um, but as many of the IBM patients who participated in that study know that is the six minute walk test sensitive enough to evaluate their entire disease? Or should we be looking at the time to get up, um, which assesses sort of proximal muscle leg strength? Um, are these measures clinically meaningful enough to the patient? So we know, um, and you'll be hearing from Dr. Jens, about dysphagia, but we know that dysphagia is a very important um, issue for IBM patients and the leading cause of morbidity and mortality. And there's very few assessments in clinical trials that capture dysphagia. Um, and then should we be looking at newer measures, muscle MRI? Um, it's important to remember that muscle MRI was helpful in um, both the Novartis proof of concept study and the initial serolimus study in detecting some changes. So should we be doing that more for clinical trials? Um, and then this is just a video, if it works, um, of a grip measure uh, that we're uh, evaluating with Dr. Leo Wang, because many of you guys know pinch is affected in IBM. So advancements really in biomarkers and outcome measures is what may be key and instrumental to earlier and faster drug development. And I'll stop there. Thank you very much for your attention. I'm gonna stop my screen share. And I believe Chris is next, Dr. Weil. Yes. I made you the host. Okay. You should have control. Okay. So I, I wanted to start to let everyone know, all the patients know, we do see your questions um, and we are gonna have time to answer your questions. Um, and uh, we're, we're, we're paying attention to them. So, um, so there will be a time for that. Um, I also wanna say that um, I know, I, I think it's really an exciting time with IBM. I can remember even two years ago or a year ago where we wouldn't ever talk about clinical trials in IBM. And now we're talking about several different clinical trials in IBM. So I think that's really an exciting time. So I just wanted to reiterate that as I was looking over the questions. So um, I'm gonna start, um, if I can get this to work. I was gonna talk about what's new in kind of our lab and our research group. Um, and, and one of the things that we've been doing more of is looking at clinical studies, and in particular clinical pathologic correlations with the autoantibody NT5C1A that we heard about a little bit. And so just to remind everybody, and, and I'm gonna try to answer a couple of questions that were in the, uh, in the feed as well. Um, Anti-NTC5-1A was identified in 2013 by two different groups, and it was thought to have some sensitivity and specificity for IBM, and we'll talk about what that means. 
Um, since that time, though, in many different studies, the positivity has been seen um, as low as 30% in patients with IBM and as high as 80% in patients with IBM, meaning that there hasn't really been a, a great consensus on, on the utility of this antibody. And it's also been found in other myositis and other inflammatory muscle, inflammatory diseases, including lupus. Um, and so the question has been, what is this antibody telling us and is it good for clinical care? And finally, as Dr. Uh, Mozafar discussed in Dr. Goyle's paper showed, um, it's been suggested that ntc 51 a may predict worsening outcomes, whether that's earlier mortality. And there was a question about, you know, what does that mean, earlier mortality? Mortality is very um, prolonged. Like the, the, the mortality in IBM, we actually tell many patients that, that you don't have an increase in mortality. So it's really, whenever we're talking about earlier mortality, we shouldn't be thinking on an individual patient basis. We should be thinking on an aggregate patient basis. And so I know one of the questions is like, well, what does that mean for me? And that's a hard question to answer whenever we're talking about mortality. The questions that we're trying to answer is what does that mean for a larger population? So I would not read too much into earlier mortality if you're ntc 5 one a positive. It really depends uh, in looking at large cohorts of patients and not focusing on what does that mean individually for me, which unquestionably is the most important question for you. What does it mean to you? And we're not dismissing that, but just the way that we think about it as scientists. So what was our question in our study? So all of those were research-based studies, meaning that they were ntc 5 one a tested on research patients and patients that, that had a research uh, test done. And um, the question that we had was, what, what is the utility of this ntc 5 one a in real clinical practice and patients that are being seen clinically? Um, and fortunately, oh, I'm going backwards. Fortunately, at WashU, we actually are a clinical testing lab. And so we've actually clinically tested. When I say clinically tested, I mean that we've tested it in patients with muscle disease in about 5,000 patients between 2014 and 2019. When I say 5,000 patients, I don't imply that they're all IBM patients. Many of them are IBM patients, but all patients in general. And so our question is, what do we see in this group of patients? So not patients that were in this research study and were tested by this research lab, but how about a clinical lab? And so a clinical lab is a CLIA certified lab, a lab that can actually do clinical testing like Quest or like uh, your hospital lab. And so the highlights of this study are that um, we found that at least if you get tested here at Washington University, and I'm, um, and I'm gonna answer a couple of questions about how you get tested. 60% um, of sporadic IBM patients were positive, and that means the sensitivity is 66%. That does mean that 33% of IBM patients are negative. 15% of muscle disease patients, so patients without sporadic IBM, also were positive. And so that means its specificity is 85%. 18% of patients that uh, were tested that had IBM and were negative initially converted to positive within a year. I don't know what that means, but that was something that we found. We did not find any clear differences um, between IBM patients with regard to clinical or pathologic features or mortality. And this is our mortality curve. Um, actually, uh, the, what Dr. Mozafar showed from his study was just a, a, a chunk of this data here just for UC Irvine, where they did see um, somewhat of a subtle change. Whenever we aggregate the data together with other sites, we didn't see a difference. Um, this means that this study needs to be validated in a prospective trial like the one that Dr. Mozafar was, was um, asking, not in retrospective reviews. And the confusion that you as patients see is because we're confused too. We don't know the right answer yet. I can tell you what the answer is, for my data, for my cohort, but someone else might say something different. And so your confusion, we, we hear it and we understand it as well. And that's why we're doing these studies. Um, there was a question about how to get tested. Um, so you can ask your neuromuscular physician to test you for it. If they don't know how to test you, they can email anybody on the medical advisory board. They can email me and we can guide them to how to get tested properly. There was a question about, is it just positive and negative? Is that all we give is positive and negative? 
At this point in our lab, all we give is a positive or a negative. We do not look for what you call a titer. That might be important in the future. That might be what other labs are doing, but we do not do that. So our data, we just focus on positive and negative. Is there important questions about knowing who's high positive versus low positive? Absolutely, I don't know the answer. So if I knew the answer, I would tell you and you wouldn't be asking those questions. So it's really hard and challenging to, to, to look at some of this, the, the, the data without having all the information, which is what we're trying to do. So what are the remaining questions from our study? Should patients get anti-NTC 5-1A testing? I, I test all of my patients clinically. I think it's important. You might go to another neuromuscular physician that says, I don't think there's any relevance to it because of the data that Dr. Weil just showed. I test patients. I don't know if I can totally know if there's an important uh, clinical implication or not, but I, t I test. So should patients get tested? I think that depends on the physician. With a sensitivity of 66% and 85% specificity, is it really a good test for diagnosis? Probably not in isolation. So should you just go to the supermarket and get an NTC 5-1A test and feel confident that you had it or not? Probably not but maybe in conjunction with other clinical or laboratory details, it might be beneficial. One question that we have thought about is, could you use it as a screening test for a high-risk patient? So could a patient that's developing weakness at a, at a higher rate than you could expect, could it be used? I don't know the answer to that, and I'm not advocating it, but those are questions that we would love to think about and answer. Could it replace a biopsy? I don't know the answer to that. All of my patients with IBM, I think need a biopsy at this point. That's how I do my, my clinical practice. Could it someday replace a biopsy? Maybe, I don't know the answer. Those are questions that we'd love to, to continue to answer. So the other things that, um, that we're doing in our lab are just understanding uh, from a more basic science standpoint, um, uh, the reason that proteins aggregate in skeletal muscle. And I just wanted to show one kind of example of what we're doing. So this is a biopsy of a patient with IBM. It shows many of the features that we see, which are inflammation, but it also shows the degenerative features that we see, where we can see proteins aggregating and we see vacuolation occur. And if we do immunostaining, where we actually look and try to see if there are proteins that are aggregating, we actually see proteins that aggregate in many of these fibers, where some fibers don't have any aggregates in them and may be um, uh, not as effective, affected. And what we did is we took samples of proteins uh, that were in, in regions of muscle fibers. So this is an affected muscle fiber, and we took a sample of this region here. And then we took a sample in a region that we thought looked normal in the same fiber. And then we took a region of muscle uh, from, from, from a, a unaffected fiber. And then we also did the same, and I don't have a picture of a normal person, but we also took a, a samples from normal patients. And then what we did is we tried to identify all of the proteins that were in those regions and all of the proteins and their concentrations. And what did we find? And so we found a lot, a lot of stuff. And so I put here, we found 6.5 times 10 to the seven data points of information. And so we had really what we call big data at this point. And this takes special analyz and analyze, analyzing, uh, analyzing in order for us to really try to understand that. And so what we did, is, is we, we looked at the, um, at, at the abundance of aggregate prone proteins and they increase as you get closer to the inclusion body. And so what I wanna point out is if you look at this sample, this is how many the abundant of aggregated proteins are. If we look here, it goes up. And if we look here, it goes up more. This is probably what you would expect to see. Um, but then what we did is we said, well, let's look at individual proteins. And so what we did here is we looked at the proteins that we found in the aggregate and they do indeed increase. And then we looked at how we thought those proteins really should behave. And most aggregated proteins actually decrease, except for some of these kind of outliers here. And so why do we care about individual protein behavior? Because we think that the identify, identification of individual proteins may tell us what are the drivers of aggregation in sporadic IBM. And what would a driver of sporadic IBM aggregation be? A driver, we think, would be a highly abundant protein. It has to be aggregate prone. It has to be present in the aggregate, and it can't behave like other proteins that are similarly abundant but don't seem to aggregate. 
And we identified one of these proteins called Desmond. And the question is, is Desmond now, is it a therapeutic target? And so can we decrease or knock down Desmond? And, and I think um, one thing that we're, that we're missing in all of our talks is how they're interrelated and interconnected. Dr. Mozafar talked a lot about how we get clinical care ready, how we get um, studies set up for natural history studies. And Dr. Goyle talked about how we actually do those studies and how we do them. And what we're talking about here is what we call preclinical studies. So how do we actually identify therapeutic targets? How was all the legwork done to see if aramoclamol was gonna work? And that's what we're talking about here. And so can we decrease or knock down Desmond? And so we've actually been doing this with a grant that we got from Catalyzed uh, Cure, where we have a model of protein aggregation in a myotube where you can see Desmond aggregates, and we're screening for small molecules or oligonucleotides that can decrease the Desmond. And so we have some candidates here. And so th the remaining questions are, you know, can we do this in a mouse model? Does lowering Desmond, does that actually do what we think it should do? Does that actually decrease aggregate formation? Is it good or bad? It could be that it's a terrible idea. And so we need to actually see if that's true um, or if it actually helps. And in addition, can we identify other proteins that might have similar properties to Desmond that might also be good candidates that we could use lowering strategies to improve muscle function? And so I just want to thank, thank my group, um, and then uh, obviously we'll have time to, to answer questions um, later. And I'm going to hand this now over to, to Jens. All right, you should be the host now. Okay, so I guess you all see my screen. Otherwise, uh, please give the thumbs down. Um, thank you, Tom. Um, hello, everybody from across the ocean. Um, thank you very much for inviting me for giving um, the final lecture of um, today's conference. I would really like to thank the TMA for bringing us all together. And it looks so simple just to pick five individuals and present um, to um, 265 participants. Um, it's a tremendous work behind the scene and um, I really thank everyone at uh, TMA for all this effort, which I think is really worth it. Um, we see in the medical community, we see uh, many conferences that haven't um, taken place or which have been shifted or which um, are taking place on a much smaller scale. And uh, um, as much as I can see, I think this is really a lively uh, conference and uh, it really pays out for all of the participants. Uh, thank you for that. Okay, without further ado, um, this will be the last uh, lecture um, of today. And um, my um, talk will, will be scientifically much less sound um, compared to all of the other really excellent lectures, but I think it will be clinically relevant. So um, swallowing is important in IBM. All of you are aware of that. And I would like to um, bring you to the uh, world of um, swallowing. So there are um, four phases, the oral preparation phase, the oral phase, the pharyngeal phase, and the esophageal um, phase. Swallowing is a really complex um, procedure and it's controlled by various regions in the brain and over 30 muscles. And important is to bear in mind that it's an active motion and it's independent of gravity, which on the reverse means that if there is a problem, we can't just rely on gravity to bring the food down. And that's the reason why in many diseases, particularly in the um, field of neurology, um, the dysphagia is a common um, feature. This is 
um, true for several neuromuscular disorders like ALS, myasthenia, but also in stroke and Parkinson's disease and other conditions as well. So in IBM, we see that dysphagia is quite common. It affects about two thirds of the patients. It clearly re leads to a reduced quality of life. It causes a risk of aspiration and malnutrition. And um, we already um, heard about this, that there is an increased uh, risk of um, death by aspiration and pneumonia. At the same time, although it's so important, it is really often overlooked by patients as well as caregivers because patients seem to often not to report the swallowing abnormalities because the impairment may occur slowly, progressive, and it may not be perceived as disease related, but simply to aging maybe or other factors. This is taken from a very uh, recent uh, review that we have put uh, together on dysphagia in myositis. Um, initially, there should be some screening questions and I will um, show a few more on those in a minute. For example, does food get stuck in your throat? Do you have to swallow repeatedly? And then um, some patient-based questionnaires could be used like the Sydney swallowing questionnaire and other um, questionnaires which have been standardized in order to dissect if um, a swallowing abnormality is present or not. And then technical procedures should be performed like the um, fiber optic endoscopic evaluation of swallowing, the fees and video fluoroscopic uh, measurement. Um, we will um, go in more details on those um, techniques and what they actually um, stand for and how they look like um, in a minute. And then in the end, maybe um, some additional research-based um, tools can help to um, identify what's going on and then the multidisciplinary uh, treatment should follow. So some of the questions that could be used is, for example, do you experience difficulty chewing solid or liquid food? Do you have to swallow multiple times or in small portions? Do you choke or cough during eating? Does food get stuck in your throat? Does eating take longer than normal or previously? Did you change your eating habits? For example, avoid a certain food. The um, questionnaires that I just mentioned um, um, is, um, they include the swallowing quality of life scale, 13 questions, the Sydney swallow questionnaire um, with 17 questions, the FOIS with um, a very simple seven level scale, and the MD Anderson dysphagia inventory with 19 questions. Of course, um, due to matter of time, I can't um, bore you with any more details uh, with um, these questionnaires. So the um, fees is shown here. Um, it, there is a small catheter with a camera at the end, which is invert, inserted through your nose. And this enables that one can actually um, look at um, the glottis from the top um, and see you breathe and speak and swallow. This is how it looks like in an IBM patient with no dysphagia. The whiteout is the actual um, second of the swallow. And on the right hand side, there is a patient. You can look from the top. The patient tries to swallow a, a greenish colored puree and the patient continues to try to swallow, to swallow. The camera gets blurred and this greenish stuff refuses to go away because of the severe dysphagia in this individual. The next technique is an x-ray based technique, the video fluoroscopy with the barium swallow. And here on the right, you can see an image of a um, dysphagia patient in IBM. And I will again show movies to illustrate it. On the left, this is the normal physiologic a condition in a patient without dysphagia in IBM, one simple gulp and all the barium has um, gone. 
And here on the right-hand side, a very severe dysphagia of a patient who swallows multiple times and has problems to actually um, bring this down the throat into the stomach. Now, ultimately, the research technique um, that um, we identified a few years ago um, at our um, campus, um, the patient um, is, lies in the MRI scanner and receives um, pineapple juice with natural manganese, a very small sip of it with just five um, milliliters, um, through um, a small catheter connected to a syringe, and the investigator um, will tell the patient uh, when um, this little sip of pineapple um, juice will um, approach the mouth and when the patient um, should swallow. This is how it looks like on the left-hand side. Again, no dysphagia. Here you can see the whitish um, pineapple juice, which is swallowed in one gulp. You can see the tongue and see the esophagus um, glottis, epiglottis is um, all visible. Here on the right-hand side, you can see just a little part of the catheter here um, sitting and through this catheter, the pineapple juice is squeezed into the mouth. The patient is told to swallow. And now you can see, um, similar to the video fluoroscopy, but uh, without any x-ray exposure, that the patient has difficulties in clearing this uh, pineapple juice and needs to swallow again and again. Importantly, what um, others have already um, shown um, and we could um, um, confirm in our study is that there is a so-called cricopharyngeal bar. Um, it also has been called a propulsion um, in the projection of the esophagus um, sphincter. And this cricopharyngeal bar um, closely correlates with the time of the swallowing, particularly the pharyngeal transport time, which means that this is a relevant factor for swallowing. And this has just um, very recently um, been um, put together again by a Japanese uh, team of uh, researchers um, who could clearly show that in IBM, this cricopharyngeal bar, just when you um, see it by video fluoroscopy, this will be um, a risk factor for subsequent um, aspiration um, pneumonia. So what can we do um, to treat dysphagia in IBM? Um, the non-pharmacological treatment will include speech therapy, logopedic um, exercise, compensation techniques, modification of diets, and the goal is to avoid weight loss, cachexia, and um, some ways to modify the eating habits could be to eat um, more often in smaller portions, to eat more slowly and carefully, to drink water with the food and avoid big chunks and um, possibly to use a very high caloric diet. There are some invasive treatment options like balloon dilation, botulinum toxin injection, myotomy, and then of course, um, a temporary nasogastric feeding um, tube and um, through um, the skin, the PEG um, gastric feeding um, tube. Um, I picked two of these procedures in more detail. The myotomy is shown here. It's a uh, very effective but irreversible surgical um, treatment, which is effective, but of course needs to be um, decided with care. Um, one way, and this is the preference of treatment that we um, perform at our center, is the local injection of botulinum toxin, which has to be undertaken um, by endoscopy into the upper esophagus um, sphincter shown here. Um, the effect will last for three uh, months, up to six or eight months um, sometimes. Um, here is um, pulled together all of the um, reports of a little over 20 patients in the international literature that have been reported with this uh, procedure. It hasn't worked in all of them, but in most of them. And importantly, um, so far, there have never been major complications in uh, these reports and also in our clinic. So we think 
that uh, this could be um, valuable. So in summary, dysphagia is um, common and a severe symptom in, in IBM. The swallowing function should be specifically asked for during each um, visit. Standardized questionnaires should be used um, to follow up and injection of botulinum toxin into the pharyngea muscle could be an experimental treatment option for severe dysphagia in IVM. I would like to thank all the co-workers um, that contributed to the MRI um, study and uh, my group here in Göttingen and thank you for your attention. All right, great. Thank you very much, uh, Jens. And um, we have lots and lots of questions in our uh, actual Q&A. Uh, the first uh, uh, ones that I'll address are, uh, are uh, related to actually, actually your talk, uh, Jens. So uh, a couple of people are uh, asking whether, uh, whether problems with swallowing uh, also, also affect speech. Uh, breathing, and uh, overall, overall lifespan? Overall lifespan, yes. Um, unfortunately, this has been shown um, because of the risk of um, aspiration and aspiration pneumonia. Um, speech itself um, usually um, is um, less affected, but can also, during a very severe um, uh, symptoms be affected, particularly if um, um, the patient has continuous problems of um, swallowing um, um, and also um, has problems to swallow the own um, sputum, um, the own mucus. Um, if it also has um, a role in impaired breathing, this has not been identified so far. Um, we have already heard that breathing can be um, a problem in IBM and actually we are currently also looking at this in our cohort, but we have not um, studied the connection between dysphagia and breathing so far. Jens, Jens, this is Chris. I'm just looking at the questions. Can you explain your approach to somebody who would have dysphagia? What would you do first? Obviously, you wouldn't go, like, what would, what would be the first thing you'd do? Um, well, the first thing would be to um, start um, changing um, habits of eating and possibly um, diet. Um, look if, if this can improve the situation. And if, if it's a clear-cut, typical, severe IVM condition, severe swallowing, then the first thing actually what we do is um, to send them to our interdisciplinary um, neuromuscular center um, clinic with, um, EN, with an ENT doctor who is um, proficient in uh, doing the botulinum toxin injections. And um, then we um, interact with each other, um, decide if it's clear-cut IBM or maybe another um, myositis, if any pharmacological treatment um, would be done or could be done. And if it's clear-cut IVM, usually we then um, discuss with the patient if botulinum toxin um, would be favored. And then this would be our number one procedure because it's reversible and um, it works very quick. And if it would not work, it wouldn't uh, do long-term harm. Tom or Namita, do you guys do it differently? Obviously that's in Germany. <laughs> yeah, we normally refer uh, individuals initially to a, a actual speech therapist, and uh, there are uh, a number of uh, exercises and, and, and things and, you know, modifying diet that uh, usually we'll try first. Amita, what about your center? Yeah, similarly, we have a speech therapist in our clinic that evaluates all patients. Um, she typically will look at a modified barium swallow. And then um, if we feel that the dysphagia is quite significant, we will refer to our ENT colleague here at Irvine who has a lot of interest in um, evaluating patients 
with IBM and dysphagia, and um, he has been exploring if cricopharyngeal dilatation would be effective in our patients. So we would approach with the dilatation first, typically. So basically, the ENT or the GI doctors would stick a balloon down and then dilate it. And we would do that. That is, um, I, I, I don't know if I should say it's reversible or not. It usually uh, has to be done uh, repeatedly again and again. Um, but then, uh, and then we would go with uh, uh, cricopharyngeal myotomy. Um, we don't have anyone here at WashU that does um, botulinum toxin, so I just wanted patients to know that that's um, not not always an option. And doesn't and and although that's what's preferred at Jens's center, that doesn't mean it's not a f uh, something that other centers can do different things. I guess. And as uh, Dr. Lyle mentioned, um, we do do cricopharyngeal dilatation, but. It um, oftentimes, it does need to be repeated, and there are there is about a maximum number before um, it becomes concerning that it may rupture. So um, it's not that you can have it done repeatedly for the rest of the life. May, may I maybe um, have a, a quick answer to that? So it it has been on my list, and actually um, until uh, this lecture, usually uh, if, if some of you know my old slides, I had it uh, side by side um, uh, with the other procedures. There is a reason why we think that balloon dilation um, might not be um, perfect because we because we work so closely with the ENT doctors and they have really tremendous experience with many conditions of um, 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 many surgical uh, tumors, strictures, whatever can happen to the esophagus. And they always tell us that in all of the IBM case, cases, they have never felt, they have never seen any physical stricture like um, abnormality. So what we see by video fluoroscopy is really a functional stenosis. So um, we think that there is no indication to really dilate something which is not present. It does work, yes, and we um, see patients from other centers who, has, who have um, um, had this procedure, but as Namita just said, um, this the treatment effect vanishes over time as opposed to other um, procedures. So yes, it's doable and yes, it's also on the list and um, it was on, on one of our slides, but um, um, I think it, it should be used with care. All right, great. We're uh, uh, actually running low on time. Uh, a number of questions have been uh, raised about uh, actually BCP, familial IBM, uh, inherited uh, IBM and uh, actually whether any clinical trials are uh, available uh, available for them. Uh, would you like to uh, answer that, Chris? Sure. So, so, so yeah, so I think th uh, there was a couple of questions about the distinction between we use IBM, we use SIBM or sporadic IBM, and we use sometimes HIBM, which is hereditary IBM. So IBM itself is probably the larger umbrella of which um, sporadic IBM is the sporadic form that doesn't seem to have a clear genetic cause. And then there are hereditary forms that likely have a clear genetic cause. If someone uses the term IBM, my guess is they're talking about mainly sporadic IBM. I can't say that for sure without knowing the context, but I think it's okay to use IBM and not SIBM whenever we're talking about sporadic IBM. As we're moving into an era of genetic medicine, it's probably more critical to say that you have hereditary IBM and to know the gene that it's associated with or know that it's truly a hereditary form, and that's the distinction. So one of the Forms of hereditary IBM is due to mutations in a protein called uh, VCP. Um, and um, we, we, uh, we're interested in, in that disease as well. And in fact, 
Um, if you were to look in large groups of patients with sporadic IBM, you actually would find that about two to 4% of them actually have a hereditary form of IBM. And so I, in our clinic, we're interested in genetics of disease. We actually do genetic testing on everybody that comes into clinic with sporadic IBM because we think that there are um, patients with hereditary IBM in that, in that cohort. Um, there's no specific treatments yet for those diseases. Everything that we're talking about with treatments for sporadic IBM absolutely could be applied to hereditary IBM with maybe some exceptions focused on the immune system, but the studies focusing like aramoclamol and things like that could definitely be applicable to, um, to VCP. And in fact, aramoclamol was initially studied preclinically, so meaning in a mouse, in a model of VCP disease. Um, just as we're trying to understand how the disease of IBM progresses, we're still trying to understand how the hereditary diseases progress. And so um, I would encourage you to reach out to, um, to, to myself or, or others on the group if you're interested in, in, in looking at um, the, uh, what, what, we're, what an organization called Cure VCP is doing, which is focusing on, on, on that hereditary form. Okay, great. Uh, a number of questions uh, related to uh, off-label treatments. Uh, uh, actually, things like like growth hormone, uh, testosterone, hyperbaric chamber, uh, IV ozone, and others uh, that I'm not aware of. Would anyone like to answer those? I nominate Namita. <laughs> Just Thanks. because she's from I California. <laughs> um, you know, I, I think uh, that's uh, that's certainly a challenge. I know I be, I'm seeing a lot of questions about how to participate in trials. What else can we do? Um, there's a lot in terms of um, we want to try supplements. We want to try medications when we're not involved in clinical trials. And we certainly, on the Medical Advisory Board, know and understand that. Uh, the reason we do clinical trials is because all agents have potential risks. Um, anytime you're putting anything in your body, even if it's a supplement, we don't know if there's going to be adverse reactions, unwarranted reactions. Um, and so that is why we tend to do test drugs, test, test hormones in a clinical trial format so that we can make sure um, the most important thing is we're not causing harm to your disease. So I'll speak on behalf of myself. I do not tend to prescribe something off-label um, because at the end of the day, I don't want to cause harm to my patients. And so I personally haven't tested growth hormone. Um, I haven't tested major concerning drugs that could cause um, harm to my patients. I don't know if Dr. Weil or Dr. Mozafar want to contribute. To jump in. So, I mean, I, so I, I, um, I, th I think, you know, we are a data-driven group, and so we're on the Medical Advisory Board because we're very focused on, um, you know, the, what the evidence is showing. And so when a patient asks me, um, you know, what diet or what, um, uh, what certain uh, off-label medication, I'm not hiding any secret information. I just truly don't know the answer. And so... Um, I think that um, that's important to recognize. If I say, you know, I don't know if metformin works or not, it's because I really don't know if metformin works or not. It may have been tried in, in other patients. Um, my biggest job, and I think all of our job, is to be an advocate for you as a patient. And so I think if a patient wants to be on a certain medication, you know, we would have a long discussion about what would be the pros and cons, why, um, why I would, um, you know, advocate it or not. The other long question I have with patients is, is how are we going to know if it works? 
And so um, if nothing happens, how are we going to know that it, that it works? So I think, I think it makes it a challenging question. Um, I would say that, that um, supplements and things like that, if they make you feel better, if you, if you figured out what works for you, that is awesome. And you should let us know what, what works for you. But just because it works for you doesn't mean I'm going to recommend it to my next IBM patient. Um, and, and it's not because I'm hiding anything that another patient something worked. It's just because I don't know for sure if it's, it's working. Okay, great. Uh, a number of questions uh, related to uh, early swallowing problems like uh, actually, actually problems snoring uh, or, or drooling mucus, uh, mucus buildup. Um, so uh, actually, actually, Jens, would you like to uh, address some of the uh, early features of, of dysphagia? The um, early features um, of dysphagia um, are probably along the lines of um, the test questions that I mentioned, that um, the um, IVM patients have problems in um, swallowing particularly bigger chunks of food, um, for example, um, um, a piece of steak um, and often um, need to drink. Uh, it could happen that um, it is required to, um, to cough, uh, to cough uh, during an um, eating, and uh, that the time uh, that is required um, to eat the same amount of food um, is um, clearly prolonged. So such could be indicators of an impairment of swallowing. Okay. Do you think? Uh actually drooling or uh, a uh, actual buildup of, of phlegm in the back of the throat is, is common in uh, IBM? Um, this, yes, this is common, but uh, this would at least to the patient cohorts that uh, we usually see, this would normally not be um, a primary symptom. So yes, this can occur but usually this occurs at a later stage at a, um, a more severe dysphagia. Okay, um, is uh, anyone aware of uh, any clinical trials or uh, actual therapies that are, are really specifically good for uh, individuals with advanced IBM? Uh, maybe those who are, are non-ambulatory uh, and uh... so, so I mean, I think that's a, a really important patient population that that we need to be thinking about. So I appreciate someone bringing that up. That's a great a great question, and so that's where we want to focus on things like upper extremity strength and focus on because because I guess what I would say um, is that um, in order. I guess what I would say is we need to understand the natural history of that group of patients. So we often think of natural history as how far can somebody walk? Can they get up out of a chair? But we also need to be thinking about natural history from the context of what can they do with their upper extremities? Can they stack cans? Can they, um, does pinch still work? Um, what, what types of things can we do? And so I think that's an important patient population. I don't think there's any reason to believe at this point that the therapies that are focused on um, earlier stages of IBM won't work in patients with um, advanced IBM. So I think what you're hearing is that that trial isn't, you're not eligible for that trial. That doesn't mean that that drug isn't going to work for you. It just means in order to power a study so that we can see a clinical effect, we're using a patient population that we understand the natural history in better that we think we can see a change in. So, um, so I wouldn't want anyone who has advanced IBM to think that they are a neglected or forgotten group because that's not true. Um, we, we, um, we, 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 would, um, we would think about, uh, about them and, and any types of therapies. And I would uh, add to that, um, just like Dr. Weil mentioned, 
Um, I think it's really important for these patients who are wheelchair dependent and may not qualify for a drug trial, this is your time to participate in some of the biomarker studies, the natural history studies that are either upcoming or being planned. Um, and then what we didn't talk about today is the role of exercise. So there have been some very nice physical therapy studies um, that are quite important in patients that are wheelchair dependent um, and aren't walking that we know are quite effective. So I do not undermine the role of exercise. In fact, I think it's probably one of the more powerful drugs we have available for our patients. Stationary cycling these days in the pandemic where we can't go to the gym, I've, been, I've heard my physical therapist tell a lot of patients that on Amazon, you can buy these stationary pedals that are just the pedals and you can sit in a chair and pedal. And the role of exercise should not be forgotten. Great. Um, all right, well, uh, we are uh, after one o'clock. I'm not sure if uh, we're gonna be getting kicked off uh, or not. Um, Lori, you know? About 115 uh, is the next oh. session starting. So if you wanna run over a couple more minutes, that should be perfectly fine. Okay. All right, great. Hey, Tom, I see a question that I was wanting to address. So there's a question right. about life expectancy that I've, I've seen and just, um, and I just wanna clarify, um, when we as physicians talk about, um, you know, um, and, and I use this narrative too with patients, and so I feel like I wanna clarif clarify it. I say, oh, you know, you're not gonna, your life expectancy isn't changed with IBM that you don't have a, 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 a higher risk of, of dying from IBM. You do have a higher risk of getting comorbidities with IBM. So you have a higher risk of having pneumonia and dying from pneumonia. Um, and so um, I, I think the reason I'm saying that is because if we address the swallowing difficulties, if we are mindful and address breathing issues, I think we can really actually make people live longer. One of the other reasons that people die with IBM is they fall and break their hip and then get very sick. I know how to fix that. Don't fall. I realize that's kind of a glib thing to say, but I'm being serious that whenever we start thinking about treatable reasons in this disease, the, the recent data suggests that nearly 100% of patients with IBM have fallen in the last year, and almost 70% have fallen within the last three months. That's a huge pile of data to suggest that falls are really important and preventable. So, so I, I, think, I think that that is, um, when we talk about life expectancies, um, you, you're not gonna necessarily, um, IBM's not going to just slowly eat you up and make you uh, whittle away as much as these other comorbidities that we think we can help manage um, are, 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 are addressed. I don't know if anyone else wants to give their... No, I, I mean, I, I would agree with that. And I couldn't uh, actually, um, I have to emphasize the role of a multidisciplinary clinic. I mean, I tell my patient that one fall is too many. I mean, even one fall is, I mean, could have really hurt the patient. But I, I think that's why it's important that we have a holistic, uh, comprehensive approach to patient where they get seen by physical therapists. What can we do to prevent the falls? What can we do to conserve the energy? We have them seen by speech pathologists to look at the swallowing and ref early referrals to ENT if there is a need for Botox injections or dilatation or cricopharyngectomy. Um, also look at other aspects of it. So, um, I think one thing we have not talked about is sleep dis uh, disordered breathing. So there is um, some building evidence that patients with uh, IBM, like most patients with neuromuscular diseases, may be at a higher risk for sleep disordered breathing. So sleep apnea may be common. And that's again, a very treatable condition. You, you put a BiPAP on them or a CPAP on them, and you can come overcome some of those disorders um, as well. So I, I couldn't agree with Chris more that I think a lot of these um, factors contribute to morbidity. Um, and, and again, if we are not taking care of them, may uh, contribute to mortality. 
um, but these are treatable, manageable condition. And I like our ALS patients or muscular dystrophy patients, IBM patients belong in a multidisciplinary care clinic. And uh, also uh, actually stroke, uh, you know, heart attack, things like that are uh, also, also common, you know, common causes of uh, overall mortality in, in all patients, especially in, uh, in older IBM patients. And uh, a uh, actually common question is, is whether statins are uh, actually, actually okay to take. There uh, are trials that have looked at that and uh, actually statins are, are uh, actually thought to be safe in, in IBM and, and uh, all of us recommend uh, anyone who has uh, any risk factors of, uh, 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 of cardiovascular disease, uh, elevated cholesterol to uh, actually take statins. I would echo that. I would tell statins have the best, uh, you know, although we, they get a bad rap, they have great safety records for people who've had a stroke for secondary prevention, for having a heart attack for secondary prevention. And there is nothing that I would, I would not stop somebody from, from, having, uh, from taking those medications if they had IBM. Now, now if a, I, I should, we'll do one cap. If a patient takes it and they have a bad experience with it, that's another, that's another question, but I absolutely would start them on it without hesitation. But but also depends on what the bad experience is. So I mean, the as Chris said, um, statins are lifesavers. They prevent heart attacks. They prevent stroke. And less than one percent, even even less than 01 percent, will have a catastrophic side effect from statins. So I really, I mean, there has to be a incredibly strong grounds for us to stop statins. Otherwise, the st statins are a drug that they should be on if they have a need for it. And maybe, um, of course, this is an IBM session, but still maybe uh, just to extend this to a broader group, um, um, I would um, completely agree with everything that has been said and extend this to other forms of myositis and to other forms of myopathies. Um, there is no reason um, just to simply um, stop or prevent taking um, statins um, if you have a condition of um, a myopathy or myositis, regardless which uh, which one it is. All right, great. Uh, maybe I'll maybe I'll close with uh, actually saying that uh, a number of you have asked uh, how to be uh, involved in uh, in clinical research and clinical uh, clinical trials. Uh, the uh, website clinicaltrials.gov has a, uh, a list of all uh, IBM trials that are uh, enrolling. And uh, um, all of you are actually welcome to uh, actually contact any of us on the uh, Medical Advisory Board if you're uh, interested in, in learning more about uh, any of the research studies you've, uh, you've heard about today. Dr. Lloyd, I'll, I'll also add that clinicaltrials.gov um, can be sometimes confusing for a patient. And so the Myositis Association website actually also has um, a tab where if you click clinical trials, it lists all the ongoing clinical trials, either drug interventions or non-drug um, for both IBM as well as all the myositis. Um, and I've actually used it to update myself in some of the trials that are going on with all the myositis. All right, thank you all very much. Uh, thank you audience for your uh, wonderful questions.